Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Judge Antonio Cassisi's two tribunals, the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, I welcome you to this tribute to our Nino. He was our leader, mentor, colleague, friend, and brother. The latter, both professional and in the person of another jurist, Judge Sabino Cassisi of the Constitutional Court of Italy, in blood. Our thoughts are with Nino's wife, Silvia, his son, Francesco, his daughter, Teresa, and other family members whom Judge Sabino Cassisi represents today. Nino is one of the outstanding figures in the history of international law. Nuremberg had brought to justice for the first time some of the political and military leaders of international crime. But until the ICTY, there had never existed any wholly independent international criminal tribunal. It all had to be put together from the beginning. As president of that tribunal for six and a half years, and later of the special tribunal, as jurist, scholar, statesman, author, teacher, and overlapping with jurist, judge, Nino's contribution to removing impunity from the planet is unequaled. When Ralph Riacci and I visited the family home in Florence, we learnt that from a time when they'd driven with Nino past the Peace Palace, when Francesco was very young, Francesco he described it as il palazzo di papa, my father's palace. And this mighty building has been an emblem for and of Nino throughout his life. I read from a beautiful letter in which Sylvia reminded us of, and I quote, John Keats' concept of negative capability, the quality that, according to Keats, forms a man of achievement, such as Shakespeare, master of tragedy, but also of joy and humor. Negative capability, according to this great poet, is, I quote, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. This from uh, a psychologist, I should say. I continue. This concept applies both to Nino's work and to my own psychoanalytical work. In simple words, it indicates the capacity to apprehend but not be overcome by the destructive or negative aspects in the world or in oneself, to tolerate some inevitable pain and frustration without losing a positive vision of the world and faith in positive change. Sylvia has asked me to convey to all of you who have sent the messages of support which she and her family greatly value, her and their deep appreciation. Ralph and I asked Sylvia how we should honor Nino. She asked us not to spend time lauding him. Her wish and that of her family is simply that his work be carried on in the way he would have wanted. We at the STL are determined to do so in terms of our mandate. We will strive to honor his legacy for the benefit of those in Lebanon and beyond, and not only for the present generation, by carrying out our task as our statute requires, 
fairly and expeditiously. The purpose of this event is therefore to contribute to that by setting out not a list of Nino's many awards and distinctions, but the example and challenge he has given to all of us. That includes human rights and dignity, for which, as you know so well, he campaigned indefatigably throughout his career. He spoke out passionately against injustice, impunity, and in inhumanity. He developed our corpus of human rights law, international criminal law, and international humanitarian law. He did not flinch from tackling politically sensitive topics like terrorism and self-determination. Yet his reputation was such that the great number of those for whom he was a trusted advisor included nation states. Messages of support from the Secretary General of the United Nations and from state representatives and for some, from so many others are greatly appreciated by the family. So too is the presence of the Secretary General's representative, Mr. Matthias, and the ambassadors and other state representatives here tonight. Because this event centers on the development of Nino's legal heritage, although he was himself a diplomat of distinction, our diplomatic friends will appreciate it has been necessary to select as speakers only five, each a preeminent figure in international law who is expert in one of Nino's fields. I regret that although the three languages of our tribunal are Arabic, French, and English, and we enjoy the hospitality of the Netherlands, it has not been feasible to arrange translation beyond French and English. That is being provided free of charge by very able interpreters as a mark of respect to Nino. I offer on your behalf an expression of thanks to the very many people who have worked so hard to make our tribute possible. They include the staff members of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon for countless hours of careful preparation, those who contributed to and arranged the marvelous physical exhibit you have seen in the anteroom, and to all of you who have given time and energy who organized this event for the man they and we admired and loved. One of them was his and our chef de cabinet, Dr. Guido Acaviva, who will introduce our first speaker. But before he does that, I announce that in Nino's honor at the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, we will in future be sitting in the Antonio Cassisi courtroom. Thank you, Mr. President. Once again, thank you all for joining us in this event. This will not be easy for many of us. One could have decided indeed to celebrate the person of Antonio Cassese, his warmth, his humble attitude, his enthusiasm for work and friends, his urge and determination in fighting for human rights throughout the, glo throughout the globe, always combative, yet courteous. It would actually have been rather easy, I'm tempted to say comfortable, for many of us gathered here today to recall events, anecdotes, even jokes he made, and just relish the memories we hold dear of him. But this would probably be untrue to Nino himself and to his legacy. He would not have desired mere reminiscence, pompous expressions, which we all know he loathed, or celebratory sermons. It was just not his style. Without further ado, I'm therefore honored to invite the first of our distinguished speakers today to share with us not just a remembrance of Judge Cassese, but some further reflections about his contribution to the field of international law and the homework he left for us to do 
in the forthcoming years and decades, probably. Judge Yusuf is not just an accomplished academic, but also a practitioner of international law with extensive experience in international organizations as, as well as multi multilateral negotiations. He is going to share some reflections about Antonio Cassese's role in the development of the international law of the human rights of both individuals and peoples. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, Sabino Cassese, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. An immense emptiness all around on the fourth floor, Nino is no more next door. The silhouette of the judge cycling in the park the lively exchanges, the witty stories, the ready smile are all gone. An irreplaceable friendship forever lost. A source of inspiration, a sparring partner will be sorely missing with great pain and sorrow. Though I take solace that his work will give us all a much better tomorrow. I hope you will forgive me for expressing with these lines my own and my family's profound sadness at the loss of Nino Cassese. I could not help doing that. But I am quite sure that Nino would not have liked us to gather in a ceremony such as this one just to express grief and sorrow at his passing on. He would have found it boring. He would have felt more comfortable with the manner in which many African societies celebrate the life of a be beloved one who has passed away. They use the occasion to celebrate the person's life with song and dance. But don't worry, I will not invite you <laughs> to sing and dance tonight. He was not born in Africa, but he was born very close to it. It is this geographic proximity to the South, together with his innate humanism, that helped Nino develop a keen interest in Africa and in the developing world in general. Let me begin with a general remark. I believe that we should all look back with gratitude to Nino's move, as he put it, from paper life to real life. No doubt, Nino loved his scholarly work and sometimes described himself as a bookworm, spending endless hours in libraries and research and documentation centers. But Nino also had all this boundless energy, this drive to do things, and to go into action that neither the walls of libraries and academic buildings nor the act of writing which he loved could contain. This energy was bound to spill over the ivory towers of academia and we are all better off. And I don't mean the community of international law scholars only, but I mean humanity is better off without fear of exaggeration as a result of Nino's forays into this real life. And what a real life. For it was a real life which in the domain of human rights on which I have been asked to speak tonight involved, among other things, pounding on the high metal gates of prisoners. And this is not only in the figurative sense, it is in the real sense. For Nino several times told me about how he forced his way to one of the prisoners in Khartoum, Sudan, after having learned that political prisoners were being held there, 
and how he had to pound on the gate and ask uh, that the doors be opened for him to see what was going on inside. So he had to knock on these high metal gates of prisoners behind which torture and ill treatment of prisoners sometimes took place. He had to knock on the gates of psychiatric asylum buildings where human beings, instead of being treated, were being abused and subjected to inhuman treatment. He was profoundly marked by these experiences. One of the lessons he learned during this period in which he came face to face with evil was that, as he aptly put it, inhumanity is inextricably intertwined with our humanity. It is indeed part of our humanity. But this was no reason for complacency. It was rather a call to arms for Nino. Not the arms used for violence, for he hated that and devoted all his life to working against state violence, but intellectual arms and scholarly and judicial activities to fight this evil. And I will give you just a few examples of this fight and how, as I said, we are all better off thanks to the fight. We are all better off thanks to Nino's fight for human rights in Argentina during the military dictatorship. In his book, Behind the Disappearances, Argentina's Dirty War, War Against Human Rights and the United Nations, Ian Gast, a British journalist, gives, an, an, gives us an account of how Nino brought up the reports on disappearances in Argentina before the UN Subcommission on Human Rights and the pressures he was subjected to when the subcommission adopted a resolution at Nino's behest, although Nino himself considered the resolution rather weak. The subcommission expressed alarm at the disappearances, but even such language was too much for the Argentine military authorities of the time. And according to Ian Gust, Nino lost his re-election bid to the subcommission in 1978 due to their lobbying against him. Nino was not re-elected, but his message got through. Thanks to the resolution which he is bareheaded, the UN General Assembly adopted for the first time in 1978 a resolution on disappeared persons, which invited the states to put an end to forced disappearances. Two years later, in February 1980, the UN Human Rights Commission took the historical step of establishing a working group on forced or involuntary disappearances to examine questions relevant to enforced disappearances. Initially established for a period of one year, this working group has been subsequently renewed and has published 25 annual reports on forced disappearances in countries throughout the world. So the small stream that was born out of an innocuous resolution initiated by Nino in the subcommission soon turned into a mighty river of international indignation and action against forced disappearances. A second example. We are all better off thanks to Nino's fight for better prison conditions and for a better treatment of prisoners in Europe, a matter on which he spent four years as a member of the chair and chairman of the European Council's Committee on Torture, Torture and on which he wrote innumerable reports and recommendations. Nino often spoke about the inhumanity of solitary confinement, and one can only welcome the recent call in 2011, actually, by the European Committee Against Torture to minimize the use of solitary confinement and to apply it only in exceptional circumstances. But better than that, since 
Nino's first report is on torture and ill treatment were published. A United Nations Convention against torture was adopted, and the prohibition of torture has come to be considered as a use cognitive norm at the international level. So Nino's awareness raising undoubtedly played a role. A third example, we are all better off thanks to Nino's work and chairmanship of the UN Commission on Darfur, Sudan, and the recommendations and conclusions of that commission. We are all aware of the follow-up to that commission's recommendations at the ICC here in The Hague. So as a result of Nino's commitment, drive, and determination in all these cases, human rights have found better protection and humanity's search for dignity and justice has advanced. The evil which he had to confront in all these instances jolted the mind of the scholar and brought him back to the importance of a maxim of Roman wisdom which inspired him throughout his life. This maxim is Ominum causa omne jus constitutum est, or in English, any rule of law is ultimately made on account of human beings. Thanks to Nino's loyalty to this maxim, I dare say that international law and the law of human rights have been greatly enriched by his doctrinal contributions. To illustrate this proposition, let me very briefly refer to three examples of Nino's writings on human rights and on the interface between human and people's rights. Of course, I know on the latter that Professor James Crawford will speak to you on self-determination, but I could not resist saying a few words on people's rights, and particularly on the interface between human rights and people's rights, because this was the subject of many exchanges and discussions between me and Nino Cassese. Firstly, on socioeconomic rights, Nino campaigned on the extension of the concept of inhuman and degrading treatment to socioeconomic rights and to the application, its application to socioeconomic rights. He was always concerned about the justiciability of socioeconomic rights in general. And in an article he wrote in 1991, he called it for the extension of the prohibition of inhuman and degrading treatment enshrined in Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights to the protection of socioeconomic rights. He criticized the European Commission, Commission on Human Rights for failing to utilize the opportunity presented in the case of Francine van Volsem versus Belgium to extend the Article 3 to such rights. Nino's exhortation did not fall on deaf ears. In 1997, the European Court of Human Rights, in D versus United Kingdom, held that an HIV patient could not be returned to a state of origin where medical treatment was inadequate. The court recognized that Article 3 until then had only been applied in the context of civil and political rights. However, the court found that it must reserve to itself sufficient flexibility to address the application of Article 3 in other contexts which may arise. On the interface between human and people's rights, let me quote to you a reflection and a writing of Nino's on this, and particularly on internal self-determination. And I quote, respect for or denial of human rights is in effect the acid test which indicates whether or not a government is respecting the people's right to internal self-determination. When the rights and fundamental freedoms of members of a people are systematically denied, this means that the right to self-determination of that people is also infringing. 
From this point of view, internal political self-determination is the synthesis and the summa of human rights, end of quote. Forever the innovator and the revolutionary scholar, Nino already saw in 1995 the right to internal self-determination as a customary rule in Statu Nascendi. He warned it, however, of the stumbling blocks which lie in the way of the birth of this emergent customary rule. He attributed these stumbling blocks mainly to the attitude taken by some third world countries, which in his view did not show a convinced and consistent acceptance that national government should be based on the consent of the governed. It could perhaps be affirmed, and I told this to Nino several times, and we had many discussions on this subject, that a decade and a half after Nino's observation is that some of those stumbling blocks are on their way to disappearing if they have not already disappeared. There is movement here also, and some of his ideas are coming to fruition. Politically, we just have to watch CNN or Al Jazeera or read the papers every day to see how people in various parts of the world are fighting for internal self-determination. Legally, we may not yet be at a point where the existence of despotic and tyrannical governments, not based on the freely expressed will of their people, would be considered to constitute an infringement of the right of people to self-determination, as Nino would have wished. But we seem to be gradually, but clearly, moving in that direction with the establishment of certain, by certain regional organizations, such as the African Union and the Organization of American States, of standards and criteria whose violation is now bound to give rise to economic and political sanctions and other measures against the concerned unrepresentative government. Finally, on the right to life, the infant formula and legal formalism. Let me refer to Nino's concern about the practices used by multinational corporations in the marketing of the infant formula in developing countries and his outrage at a judgment rendered by a Swiss court on the so-called Nestlé affair in 1976. Some of you may be familiar with a chapter on his book, Human Rights in a Changing World of 1990, in which, which he sarcastically entitled it, a contribution by the West to the struggle against hunger, the Nestlé affair. Nino was outraged by the verdict given by a Swiss judge in this affair, but he did not only express outrage. He, as usual, analyzed the judgment from all angles, dissected it, and demonstrated how, in his words, it amounted to a mixture of legal formalism and hypocritical moralism. But in addition to his powerful defense of the right to life of infants in developing countries, it is his criticism of legal formalism on the part of judges which struck me most and continues, actually, to inspire my work as a judge. And I will quote to you what he wrote on that, especially on the judgment rendered by this Swiss judge. He said, when complex human affairs with manifold political and social implications are brought before the courts, a peculiar phenomenon not infrequently occurs. They become subsumed and, as it were, absorbed into the aseptic, impassive world of the law. They are stripped 
of their human dimension and translate it into legal facts, that is, into facts with abstract, timeless connotations, facts described in rigid technical terminology, offenses, lawful acts, powers, rights, obligations, and so on. It is for the magistrate concerned to abstract this process of rarefaction of life. He may do so either by reading the laws with modern eyes and a modern sensitivity, or by inserting into the formal parameters offered by those laws the real situation, worthless and all. Let us hope that these words will also inspire other members of the judicial community in The Hague. Dear Nino, rest in peace. Thank you. Judge Yusuf assisted us in starting to paint a picture, a picture not just of the person we are commemorating, but also of his legacy. Undoubtedly, Nino was a stimulating scholar, careful with the details and the nuances of the most technical aspects of the law, but without ever losing the big picture and actually striving to fill others with enthusiasm for the big picture. We are beginning to see, therefore, the contours of a person who, in the recent words of the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, was a true giant of international law. Professor Gaeta is our next distinguished speaker. She is one of Nino's most accomplished pupils, as he would call them. Herself a scholar, professor of international criminal law in Geneva, and director of the Geneva Academy. She will undoubtedly share with us part of the enthusiasm of Nino, an enthusiasm, it has been said, he made almost contagious and irresistible. Hearing Antonio Cassese speak and reason, you could hardly prevent yourself from being engaged by his reasoning, his suggestions. Whether at the onset you agreed or not, it did not really matter. He would first get you interested, then engaged, and finally often convinced. I'm sure many of you share memories of this process. Professor Gaeta, Paola, you have the floor. Good evening. In academia, in academia there are lawyers who study, research, and teach their disciplines without ever wondering what the origin of a rule or an institution is. There are lawyers who never wonder which political, sociological, economic, and historical factors have shaped the law as it stands, without ever wondering whether the law ultimately is made for the sake of human beings. In academia, there are lawyers who never wonder how the law can be changed to attain the specific goal. These lawyers can be flawless in interpreting and applying the law as it is, and sometimes they are. They build convincing and forceful legal analysis, propound sound legal constructs, and their writings are paradigmatic examples of crystal clear legal analysis. But at the end of the day, their erudition stands alone, like an ivory tower in a desert. Nino Cassese was not such a lawyer, and he didn't want to be. He was deeply convinced that the law is the product of the prevailing forces and powers in societies, and the father believed that the task of a lawyer is to unveil those forces and powers. He was therefore naturally attracted to international law, a body of law that given its rudimentary character better reveals the power game that models its rules. In particular, he was attracted to those subjects 
that are most at the vanishing point of international law, the law on the use of force, the regulation of violence in armed conflict, the struggle of peoples for self-determination, human rights. When studying these matters, Nino was therefore always attentive and listening to other disciplines, history, sociology, economics, international relations. He wanted to understand fully, he wanted to grasp the reality hidden behind the apparent neutrality of rules and legal institutions. However, in his endeavor, he was not only driven by a desire to better understand and explain. In the end, what he wanted to achieve was a knowledge directed to change. He was convinced that by becoming aware of the forces that influence the law, lawyers can identify how to influence those forces in turn and propose an acceptable and progressive interpretation of the rules. In sum, Nino believed that the lawyer should not simply be a notary. Indeed, he was also suspicious about the purely positivistic approach to law because he was afraid that expertise in legal technicalities alone could easily be put at the disposal of authoritarian ideologies and regimes. He used to say that for him, a lawyer should be like a stone cutter who uses his legal implements in the tiny fissures of existing law and little by little shapes a different figure. But what figure did he have in mind? Professor Abisab yesterday reminded us that Nino was driven by a natural empathy towards the human being. He's right. Nino was a profound humanist, and someone said he was a gentle humanizer. He was, however, also a stubborn humanizer. His strong and adamant conviction was the one he liked to express with the maxim by the Roman lawyer, Ominem causa, ominem, om, omne jus constitutum est. Every law is made for the sake of humanity. This was the North Star he never lost sight of. This is the international law he imagined. When he was elected as a judge, as soon after as, as president of the first international criminal tribunal ever created, the ICTY, he realized that the golden opportunity was being offered to him and those working with him at the newly established institution. His solid and world-renowned scholarship as an international lawyer, coupled with the experience he had acquired as first president of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, allowed Nino to assert his leadership within and outside the tribunal and to take the necessary steps to launch promote and consolidate the judicial activity of the new tribunal. In his administrative responsibilities as president of the ICTY, he was tireless. In his judicial capacity, together with his fellow judges, he set up the foundations of the ICTY, both at the procedural and substantive level. The Tadic interlocutory decision on jurisdiction issued in 1995 and to which he contributed greatly is certainly the landmark decision of the tribunal. As is well known, this decision extended the scope of application of certain rules of international humanitarian law to the neglected category of non-international armed conflicts and clarified the principle of individual criminal responsibility for war crimes in these conflicts. All this by having recourse to customary international law. This was an important achievement, also supported by the philosophical conviction that, as the Appeals Chamber stated, treatment that is inhuman in an international armed conflict and therefore prohibited is not less inhuman in a non-international armed conflict and therefore should attract the same prohibition. However, in my view, the methodological approach followed by the Appeals Chamber is equally important, if not more important. With this decision, the Appeals Chamber of the Tribunal showed 
that it was not afraid to have recourse to customary international law as the applicable law of the tribunal in criminal matters. It thus paved the way for the possible global legacy of all its subsequent case law, in particular on war crimes. Sure, the appeals chamber could have taken a different approach. For instance, it, it could have confirmed the approach taken by the trial chamber, which considered that recourse to customary law was unnecessary in the case at issue. For the trial chamber, the charges against Tadic were covered by the jurisdictional provision of the ICTY statute on grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. In practice, the trial chamber considered that the statutory provision did not require that the tribunal had first to classify the conflict as an international conflict to apply this provision. And this, thanks to the termination of the Security Council, which had adopted the statute of the tribunal under chapter seven of the charter. This approach, however, would have meant that the tribunal's case law on war crimes would not have had a general impact on non-international armed conflicts and would have been ultimately limited to the former Yugoslavia. But the Alpice Chamber, as is well known, decided differently and relied on custom. Since Tadic, reliance upon customer international law has become a constant feature of the case law of the tribunal. And this case law has catalyzed a revival of the importance of custom in sensitive fields such as international humanitarian law, human rights law, and international criminal law itself. Perhaps recourse to customary international law by the tribunal should have been more cautious in certain decisions and judgments, perhaps, and certainly it is not flawless. Nonetheless, today, nobody Nobody would doubt that without the target decision and the ensuring heavy recourse by the ICTY to customary international law, there would be simply be no international criminal law at all. If we now enjoy the luxury of discussing issues such as respect for the principle of legality, the limits and flaws of the doctrine of joint criminal enterprise, and many other substantive and procedural issues, it is only because of the bravery of the ICTY in referring to customer international law. Nino Cassese was among those who must have this bold approach. The outcome could be criticized and has been criticized and sometimes rightly so. But criticism should not lead us to lose sight of the whole picture. In a way, to me, Nino reminds me what he did with international criminal law reminds me of what Michelangelo did with his prigioni, the prisoners. These are impressive, unfinished sculpture, and each prigione, each prisoner, represents a strong and muscular man imprisoned in the marble, a man who strives to get out of the marble with all his energy and power. With his strenuous and restless activity as president and judge of the ICTY, Nino Cassese simply wanted to liberate international criminal justice from the marble which was trapping it. We are now responsible for refining it. For Nino, the refinement of international criminal law was mainly the task of scholars who could have influenced judges and case law. Unlike Michelangelo, Nino, did not want to leave his prigione unfinished. Therefore, his activity as a scholar and a mentor to his pupils and friends was driven by his desire to achieve this result, by fostering academic reflection, by encouraging constructive criticism of the case law of international criminal tribunals, ultimately by taking an active role in the building of a community of scholars in international criminal law. He published his successful handbook on international criminal law. When the Statute of Rome was adopted, he edited, with the help and assistance of others, a commentary of the Statute, which also tried to take stock of the past experiences of the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals and the, of the ICTY and the ICTR. 
He launched the Journal of International Criminal Justice, which has become the leading journal in the field. He edited a voluminous companion to international criminal justice and a casebook in international criminal law. Moreover, Nino was a mentor to many of us, within and outside academic circles. He was always ready to suggest new topics for an article or a critical comment on a national or an international decision. He was always generous and meticulous in revising drafts and suggesting improvement, always open to constructive criticism and lively discussion. Beyond academia, he restlessly tried to popularize the notions and institutions of international criminal justice through books and articles and interviews in the press everywhere in the world. His firm belief was that the public opinion and civil society could play an important role addressing the inefficiencies of the international mechanism for enforcement and put moral authority where the law fails or is silent. The UN Secretary General said that Nino was the giant of international criminal justice. I think he was not only that, I think he was also its father. The future of international criminal justice is now in our hands. In particular, it is in the hands of the International Criminal Justice Court, of its judges, its prosecutor, its staff. I think that the court ought not to be afraid of walking the road Nino stubbornly paved. The court can and must be bold. The court can and should interpret its statute in a progressive and expansive manner without ever losing sight of its objectives, the most important of which is not spelled out in the statute, that of demonstrating that it's a court for all crimes committed by whomever, a court that is not suspected or perceived to be a tool in the hands of a few powerful countries. At the end of my tribute to Nino, I doubt that I've really satisfied the expectation of the president of the STL and the organizers of this evening. I suspect that they were looking for legal reflections about the legacies of Nino's scholarship and judicial activity and its impact on the future of international criminal law. I've tried to do my best given the circumstances, and I apologize if I didn't manage to realize these expectations. I still feel full of grief, of sorrow, and not ready for this sort of exercise. On the deepest personal level, I must also confess that it's odd to me to stay, to stay here with you tonight in The Hague without Nina around. And yesterday, while looking at the building of the ICTY from the main entrance of the World Forum Conference Center, I could not stop seeing him locking his bicycle to a pole close to the tribunal with his blue coat and hat and the red scarf and his cheerful smile. I think that we miss him terribly. To conclude, I would like to quote the last passage of the first edition of his Human Rights in a Change of Word, published in 1990. At the end of his analysis, Nino tries to explain the reason why one should strive to enhance the protection of human rights when they are so systematically disregarded everywhere in the world. His answer is simple and, as he put it himself, very humane. He says, and I quote, Remember the last scene in the trial by Kafka, a novel that holds the key of our existence when Mr. K, awaiting trial, is dragged at night by two representatives of the law to a lonely stone quarry. Before he is stabbed in the back for unknown crimes, a window in the house opposite is thrown open and a figure appears and spreads its arms wide. Who was it, the man who is about to be killed, wonders? A friend, a good man, Someone who sympathized? Someone who wanted to help? Who is it one person only? Or were they all there? Was help at hand? Perhaps, Nino concludes, it is enough for one about to die in a prison, a concentration camp, a mine, a torture chamber, a city destroyed by bombs, 
a village oppressed by draft, to know he does not die alone. The figure in the window is not indifferent. He will at least protest, not much by way of consolation, but better than dying completely alone and forgotten. I will now invite to speak Professor Abi Saab, a former colleague of Judge Cassese on the ICTY Appeals Chamber and an eminent Egyptian scholar and practitioner of international law. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Dear friends, I say friends because tonight at least we are all friends of Nino. So we have something in common. We are all friends, at least in Nino and in his memory. I may be one of the oldest friends of Nino. After what Abdi and Paula have said, they left very little for me to add about humanitarian law. And I cannot avoid starting with some personal reminiscences. I met Nino for the first time 50 years ago, in 1961, when I landed in Geneva at the Graduate Institute of International Studies. I was coming to finish my thesis. Nino had just spent a year working there. We coincided a little during that time, enough for me to see that this little boy, I was also a boy then, is really an intellectual, I wouldn't say giant because it was not that, but very promising young man. And then, and this is what really makes me feel very emotional today, then we met here in, I wouldn't say in this building, but on this terrain in the old academy, the Hague Academy, which was destroyed to, in order to build this nice building a few years ago, in 1964. 1964, uh, an important Italian professor was giving the general course, Ronaldo Quadri, whom I had the benefit of having as a teacher in Egypt. But when he came, came with him 54 Italians. You could say all the mafia of international, Italian mafia of international law. And Quadri, I gave him an article I had written about the third world and international law, and Quadri was kind enough to mention it in, in his course, and so I became an honorary member of this Italian mafia, who was the most, there were very, the older people like Conforti, Lianza, uh, but there were younger people also. But among them was Nim, whom I had met a few years ago in Geneva. And we spent three weeks here, hearing lectures, going to dinner together, going to Schiffningen at night, and so forth. And we became very, very close. You know, when you meet someone who shares your ideas, opinions, what was the ideas we were sharing? We wanted to change the world. <laughs> we were progressives. And Nino has always been a progressive. He was not, as the title of the film, Rebel Without a Cause. He was a rebel with a cause. But what we were looking for was a battlefield where you can defend this cause. And that explains the different areas where Nino has somehow, and to a lesser extent, I squatted. Because international law, as Nino used to say, international law is like a giant without a feet. So somehow you have to find an artificial leg for it for him. And when you can find an artificial leg to make this giant move, then you have done something, uh, which explains the different fields, etc. I was asked to speak about humanitarian law, but in fact, 
the large, the large uh, generic cause that Nino was serving, as it was said by the previous speaker, was the human being. How can we, as international lawyers, a very uh, ethereal subject, uh, as Lauterpacht said, that if international law is uh, at the vanishing point of law, then the law of war is at the vanishing point of international law. Uh, how can we serve people, the individual? For me, it was very easy because I'm a third worlder, and we were in the beginning of the 60s fighting for the, and Nino became a great third worlder uh, as well. Uh, in fact, he worked a lot, and we worked together in the end of the 70s to develop what is called the Algiers Declaration of the Right of Peoples on the bicentenary of the USA. We wanted to do something equivalent, <laughs> but for the rights of people. And we had meetings, etc. And, and Nino edited a book on the Declaration of Algiers. Eh? Uh, so that was one, one area. But in fact, uh, humanitarian law came into the picture at the end of the 60s, but particularly in the first seven years of the 70s through the diplomatic, the uh, government experts conference, then the diplomatic conference on international humanitarian law, which met to uh, update the Geneva Conventions and complement them. Nino came several times in the Italian delegation, but the Italian government was alternating the delegates, etc. And I, I was on the Egyptian delegation, and as I was teaching in Geneva and was not causing any uh, expenses for the Egyptian government, they put me in the delegation. <laughs> so I, I participated in all the sessions. Nino came, the Italian government at that time, you know, it was, uh, I think, uh, the Christian uh, uh, Democratic Party, etc., was, was very, very, very conservative. Uh, Nino, in his way, but others as well, but Nino particularly, try within the small margin they had to push things in the right direction. He was always consistent in that to the, to the point of sometimes antagonizing the head of the delegation. And in the meantime, he would, at that time, he was in Pisa, at the University of Pisa teaching. He would between the sessions, call conferences. And as soon as the, the protocols were adopted, he immediately called a big conference and really twisted our arms in immediately to produce chapters, etc. And the first book, the first book on the protocols called The New International Humanitarian Law was edited by Nino and published in 1979. Uh, the one book of studies and another book of discussions with the major actors in the conference. Nino then moved to uh, Florence. And in Florence, again, he would invite, prepare conferences on the use of force in international law. It was mentioned on the new area which was state responsibility where there is a very famous conference on state crimes and he would publish the books uh, in fact uh, our colleague uh, uh, Ian Brownlee who has departed also uh, recently uh, was saying laughingly Nino is the best intellectual entrepreneur I know, because he put us all to task to produce books on the current events as soon as they take place. And he, he had this galvanizing power to, to, to bring people together. And 
he was not at all an austere scholar. After we would meet, we would go downtown or by the river in, 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 uh, in Florence to eat in one of the caves and, and things like that. He liked life. And it is because he liked life that he wanted to use law to enhance life, to enhance the life of the others. Uh, things went on and uh, by a freak of circumstance we were both elected to the ICTY when it was created, so we were there at the creation. Uh, it was not easy for Nino to get elected as president because there was a lot of reticence to have a European as a president because um, people were worried that, that he may have, it was too close to, to the theater. But happily, and those who knew him tried as much as possible to uh, convince the others, and Nino was elected. And it was the best thing that happened to the ICTY because the ICTY had very dim prospects. To tell you the truth, nobody, uh, the, today and yesterday, we were celebrating the legacy of the ICTY. All, all the accused have been apprehended and put to trial. All of them, 161, starting from the heads of state and heads of uh, uh, non-recognized states, uh, to the small fry. But when we started, nobody believed that we would have half or even any, any big fish. Uh, and we had great handicaps. The first handicap was the UN bureaucracy. Uh, it's nice for Ban Ki-moon now to say that Nino was a great giant, but at that time it was Terrible. They wanted to treat us as a simple uh, subsidiary organ of the Security Council and said, listen, we are a tribunal. We have our independence. We cannot function, etc. For, for years, we didn't have a budget. We would have temporary appropriations. Uh, we couldn't hire people for any length of time. Uh, uh, etc. And then some in the legal division wanted to impose their views, etc. We needed really a very str strong face, eh? a leap of faith almost, in order to, to stand our grounds and push as much as we can for the tribunal while we had nobody to prosecute. That's the problem. And uh, happily, a very small fish called Tadic, now Tadic is a great thing, uh, 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 the, one of the torturer of a small militia had the bad idea of going to visit his brother who had a small restaurant, Yugoslav restaurant in Munich. And, and the Germans caught him and then we managed after several months, uh, eight, nine months, from the creation of the tribunal to get Tadic, and the, the, the German said, yes, but he has his human rights, so we have to adopt internal legislation integrating the law, the uh, decision of the Security Council to create the tribunal into our internal system so that we can transfer Tadic. So, all that to tell you that being the president of such a torture organism was not an easy task. Nino, who is, <laughs> you all know him, who is really hard driven, uh, never, never uh, flinched. He was there. He was writing all the time. He always, all his life, slept only four to five hours a day. What do he do? What does he do in the rest of the hours? he would write. <laughs> and if you see the file of, of, of letters to the UN, to the Secretary General, to the head of the legal division, to this, to that, to contributors, because we also got money from 
contributors. Uh, I, I mean, we were acting as an NGO almost, trying to, 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 to get, uh, and th that led to, to something which was not very good because countries would second to us some of their staff, but uh, they had to act as an independ independent agents for, for the tribunal. And who, who would second staff to you? The countries which have staff, they, they can second. So uh, again, all, all that was problem. And Nino was all the time worked up, worked up. In the middle of the night, he would phone me, please come, we have to discuss. I go, discuss what, Nino? And he, 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 he would say, but we have to do something. Yes, but what can we do? At the end, I told him, listen, it's no need. You cannot speed a ship by jogging on its deck. <laughs> and that's what we are doing. Eh? We are jogging on the deck because it, we, we didn't have the hand on, on, on the wheel of, of the ship. Uh, without Nino, it's not sure that the ICTY would have survived. He was so intent on making it a success that he ended making it a success. And uh, without the ICTY, there would have never been an ICTR, nor an ICC, and as Paula said, nor international criminal law, I would say, or the modern international criminal law. That brings me to the substance, but the substance has been described by Paula. In fact, it's very difficult, you know, she spoke about customary law. We are speaking about criminal law. Nulla pene sine legge. I mean, in criminal law, if you don't have written text, it, it, it's really very difficult to, to, to pass uh, things as custom, uh, I, there is a contradiction, and even even the Geneva Conventions, you know, uh, in the 49, they introduced this category which criminalized what is called grave breaches. They didn't call them grave crimes. Why? And they simply mentioned the category like torture, etc., but they didn't define it, and they didn't give any penalty. Why? Because they say, we cannot. This is the job of criminal codes. It is for the states to adopt this. We simply in indicate the categories. An obligation on the states to criminalize them, but we cannot do it because this is international level. We had to do it. We had to do it in here. It was a very difficult job. In the Tadic case, which is a a paradigmatic case, which was my, unfortunately, with the passing away of Nino, I am the only survivor. I don't know for how long, but anyway, uh, uh, the, our four other colleagues have disappeared. No, 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 excuse me, I should have done that before. Uh, in the Tadic case, that was a big problem because as Paula said, there was an easy way out, la solution de facilité, which was to say, as the Security Council said, as the trial chamber said, oh, this case has elements, it's a mixed case, there are international elements, enough to consider it as an international international armed conflict. If it's an international armed conflict, we have no problem. We have no problem. We can, the statute says we can do it. General international law says we can do it. But Nino and those who were with him decided we should not avoid difficulty because there are two possibilities. We can take this easy way out, but we can be more specific and say there are elements of internal conflict and international conflict. And what is more important is to say that there are certain rules which apply to both. And these rules have been established even before the Second World War, starting with bombardments 
heavy bombardments in the Spanish Civil War, etc., where a lot of third states and the League of Nations took a stand saying that such uh, things, that was an internal armed conflict and there was no recognition of belligerency. So we were speaking really of an internal armed conflict where there was a large recognition of the international community that this constituted a crime, etc., etc. I'm not going to repeat what was said in, in the other conference. We ended up saying that there is enough practice, enough indication of the opinion juris, of the conviction uh, of the international community that war crimes can be, can be committed in internal armed conflict. And, uh, and that is the most important contribution of Tadic because, as you know, most, most of the armed conflicts in, after the Second World War have been internal armed conflicts. There, there are some few in, clearly international armed conflicts, but most are internal. And had we simply taken the easy way and said it's an international armed conflict, then the sway of international humanitarian law and by ricochet the criminalization of the serious violations of that law, even in internal armed conflict, would not have been established. We would have been still discussing, is it covered or not covered, and so forth. Happily, Nino was there and we were also helping and uh, we took the right road. It's true that Nino has always been driven and sometimes he is overdriven and he does an overdrive. <laughs> but I mean these are the vices of his virtues and without really pushing things you not only stay on place, but you regress. Why? Because the word passes you on. And Nino has left us, but his drive is with us. What we should do is to continue it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Abisab continued canvassing Judge Cassese's significant strides in various fields of international law with a penetrating and, I must say, moving presentation. Uh, Professor Abisab mentioned the word progressive a few times. I was reflecting upon the irony of the role of Judge Cassese when donning his judicial robes. He was an experienced practitioner. He was seasoned in international negotiations chosen by a political body, the United Nations, to be a judge first at the ICTY and then at the STL. We could say that he lived a long life in and out of the establishment, so to speak, and he was adept in the corridors of power. Yet at the same time, he was often criticized for being too radical, progressive, forward-looking, by politicians and academics alike. You would expect the former politicians and diplomats to criticize him due to his independent mind and often, frankly, undiplomatic attitude. However, one can be excused for frowning about the harsh criticism against him by academics, often young ones. These are those very academics who are actually supposed to bring fresh ideas and test the boundaries of the law. His was a revolution in a sense, he embodied the surprising and unfamiliar figure of an aging judge constrained and criticized by young, up-and-coming scholars for being too progressive. Fascinating, if you think about it. I have now the honor of giving the floor to another distinguished academic, Professor Andrea Bianchi of Geneva University, a veritable expert in various fields, including terrorism law, and its interaction with human rights law and humanitarian law. More specifically, Nino told me that profound discussions ensued between him, Professor Bianchi, and others on what he called the topic of realizing utopia, 
of a, of a realistic utopia. This was a way to ensure that the lofty ideals espoused by many international lawyers in their seclusion would be realized, at least to a certain extent, in the practical world of international politics and expediency. Professor Bianchi, you have the floor. Your ex Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I, I take the floor with sadness tonight. I would have never imagined coming to The Hague for this. I cannot pretend, nor will I claim to have been Nino's close friend. We knew each other, we crossed paths several times. We worked on a number of projects together. I said no to him a couple of times, which he did not like. He was like that. He was a dear colleague. I respected him enormously. Not having had a mentor, a maître, he was among those international lawyers whom I really looked up to and uh, by whom I was most likely inspired when I decided to turn my passion for international law into a profession. Incidentally, the passion is still there and I trust Nino might like to hear that. And that's perhaps the first legacy. Be passionate in your profession. Be committed to your values. Stand up for whatever it is that you believe in. So yes, I respected him and uh, I admired him, particularly for his musical talents. Yes, you've heard it right, musical talents. Nino was able to play different instruments before different audiences. He could play the most difficult Chopin's piano studies. He could participate in a jazz jam session with other colleagues, and he could even accept to improvise a street performance because he believed that music needs to be known and appreciated by a wider public than classical music concert halls kind of audiences. Not everyone appreciated that. I remember when he published in Italian the book that was later translated into English as International Law in a Divided World, a very important book that showed that the law has a context, that the legal dimension of international relations is part of the wider fabric, yet another lesson to be learned from him, as Paola said. Criticism was, read, uh, was raised against that book and against him personally. The book was not appreciated because it was not primarily directed to law students. And yet, that was a book that reached out to many more readers than any other international law book could ever aspire to attract. But it is not uncommon for people to criticize what they cannot themselves achieve. Sort of fox and grapes syndrome, I'd say. Nino later wrote other books, um, particularly in Italian, later translated into other languages, that were addressed to a wider public. He wrote well. He was able to convey complex concepts in a clear and comprehensible way to the benefit also of the unskilled reader. So that's what I regard as part of his legacy too. If you like music, you can appreciate different styles. And you mustn't hold in contempt talented musicians just because they happen to play different tunes. If I accepted to come here and speak about Nina's view on international terrorism, it's because I believe, perhaps wrongly, that I provided a, an occasion for him to think more thoroughly and systematically about the criminalization of terrorist acts under international law. A few weeks after September 11, 2001, I had launched a research project which later led to the publication of the book Enforcing International Law Norms Against Terrorism and I must say that was quite an experience. In the highly emotional aftermath of September 11, when international lawyers were wondering whether international law was well equipped to put up with the threat of such an unprecedented character, all the colleagues I had invited immediately answered the call. Extraordinary. It has never happened to me again. No one declined. They all came, which is quite telling about how we all felt at the time. Perhaps the profession has a conscience, after all. 
That was not the first time that Nino wrote about terrorism. He had already authored an article in 1989 in the International Comparative Law Quarterly, in which, in an act of prescience almost, he had wondered what the international community response to international terrorism should be. But the conference I organized in Milan in the context of that research project was the first time he presented and articulated uh, the vision of the criminalization of terrorism as a distinct crime under customary international law. He had dropped a hint of his theory in uh, the much celebrated article in the European Journal uh, that he wrote on uh, international terrorism as disrupting some fundamental categories of international law that he must have written while working at the paper for the conference. Uh, but the conference was, at least to my knowledge, the first time that he put forward his view before an audience and defended it. More particularly, he expounded there the uh, four elements or requirements that were necessary for him to characterize terrorism as an international crime per se. First, the effects of acts of terrorism must not be limited only to one state, but must be transborder insofar as the persons concerned, the means used, or the violence implicated transcend national boundaries. Second, the requirement that a foreign state supports, tolerates, or acquiesces in uh, carrying out the terrorist acts. Third, the terrorist act characterized as a phenomenon of concern to the international community as a whole and a threat to the peace, and fourth, and last, the terrorist acts as very serious or large scale. Now, Nino trespassed the time allotted to speakers, and the ensuing debate was almost monopolized by his own intervention. Understandably so. He had an important message to convey. It was not easy to get it across the audience, nor was it easy for the audience to take it in. Overall, it was a great performance on all sides, his and the critics. One of the rare instances in which you actually see an academic debate in academic circles. Now, many of the elements of his theory about the criminalization of terrorism as a discrete international crime were fine-tuned uh, in his later article um, on the multifaceted criminal notion of terrorism in international law published in his journal. And the editors will forgive me if I use the possessive adjective his, I think it's opposite, and in his manual on international criminal law. Both the objective and the subjective elements of the crime are spelt out at greater length and further specified in these two writings of his. For instance, as regards the uh, objective element, the idea that an act must be already criminalized in any national legal system and that the victims can be civilians, military, or other state officials. As regards the subjective element, Nino, somewhat reconsidering his previous thoughts, identified there the main purpose of terrorism with coercing a public authority, a government or international organization, or a private transnational organization, such as a multinational enterprise, to take or to refrain from taking a certain course of conduct. This could be achieved, in his view, by two means either by spreading fear or anxiety among the civilian population or by engaging in criminal conduct against a public institution, a leading personality, or a public or private authority. And finally, his emphasis on the rather unique relevance of motive to this particular crime, which can only be committed on political, ideological, or religious motivations and never be uh, committed on the basis of personal inducements although, as Nino would have conceded, this might be difficult to prove before a court. Now, besides the contention that international terrorism is a distant crime in times of peace, Nino was also convinced that it could become a distant crime in times of armed conflicts as regards warlike terrorist acts that at some point might emerge as a mixture of IHL, international humanitarian law, and general rules of terrorism as a distinct crime from the crime of terrorism as a subcategory of war crimes. If I were to summarize uh, his scholarly slash intellectual uh, itinerary on the issue of terrorism, I would emphasize the following elements. A clear aversion um, towards dealing with international terrorism at the macro level of the use of force. Already in 1989, he had foreseen the risk of an, I quote, whirlpool of spiraling violence, end of quotation. 
if an expansive reading of the notion of self-defense were to be adopted to fight international terrorism. Second, the complementarity uh, between domestic law enforcement and international jurisdictions. Third, the importance of the criminalization of terrorist conduct at the level of customary law, and fourth, the expansion of the scope of the international crime of terrorism as a distinct crime both in times of peace and in armed conflict. I'd like to add two remarks on his method. First, his thoughts on terrorism evolved over time, and I find this significant, as it shows that sometimes the law and the thinking about the law from a scholarly perspective implies taking into account changing societal demands, adjusting the intellectual tools of analysis to such changes, and, if necessary, reconsidering the views one had previously defended. Second, but this is not peculiar to terrorism, but it also applies to it, I believe, Nino always made an effort constantly to ascertain the social consensus which is necessary to found general rules of international law upon. His accurate reconstruction of international consensus broadly understood, and his particular emphasis on opinion juris in all those fields of law in which the laws of humanity, more than a scant number of executive or judicial practice, ought to make the difference, this is quite telling about his approach to law as something which is strictly related to the societal underlying texture. Nino's academic view about the issue of the international criminalization of terrorism was a strong one. And despite criticism from some quarters, he strenuously defended it. I found it intriguing, and I've wondered why that was so. And I suspect that the reason lies in what terrorism represents. Wanton destruction, indiscriminate violence, the very negation of humanity. This must have struck deep chords in Nino's intellectual and emotional worlds. Nino was a humanist. He put the human being and human values at the center of his scholarly work and of his judicial practice. He was sensitive to the human condition and unconditionally committed to making the world a better place for human beings. There is no humanity in a bomb. There is no poetry in sheer, ruthless violence. This is why the international criminalization of terrorism was so important to him. The terrorist, whoever he or she may be, is the contemporary enemy of mankind, is the hostess of many generalists, the very incarnation of evil, somebody who decides to renege on his own humanity to claim the life of innocent human beings. While thinking of this commemoration and of Nino's legacy, the book by André Malraux, La Condition Humaine, The Human Condition, later translated into English as Man's Fate, came to my mind. Malraux tells a fictitious story about a failed revolutionary attempt in China in the early decades of the 20th century. And he provides powerful psychological insights on the centrality of individual conduct to trigger social change and to affect world events. Ultimately, ultimately, it's human beings' individual choices that make the difference in politics, society, law, and more generally in life. So that's how I will remember him as a humanist. This is no diminution because at least in my own grammar, this is just as important as, and even more important than, having been a great international law scholar, teacher, and judge. At a time when law and international law seems to be coming under the spell of social sciences, methodology, and economics, and pretends to present itself in the guise of an exact science based on rational theory, rational choice, and optimal outcomes, to reclaim that legal space for the human being as a human being and not as some kind of fiction, is to me a very powerful message. Humanism, humanism as a secular religion for international lawyers. Humanism as a constant effort to reconcile reason, ethics, and justice in our day-to-day -day activities. That's Nino's main legacy to me, a daunting one indeed. Let's try and uh, be worth of it.
Thank you, Professor Bianchi, for this illuminating intervention, full of substance and uh, worthy of further reflection, actually. We are now coming to the conclusion of this portion of our tribute. Not before, however, I'm allowed to give the floor to Professor Crawford. Professor Crawford is not only universally known for his work on international personality and responsibility of states, but also for his activity as an advocate in international judicial proceedings. For instance, I was recently told that Professor Cassese and Professor Crawford were on opposite sides in the Libya-Chad territorial dispute, where they were able to exercise their scholarship and erudition in the peaceful settlement of disputes before this court. Also, as many of you know, Professor Crawford wrote an illuminating review of Cassese's book uh, entitled Self-Determination of Peoples, a review which makes justice of the complex status in international law of the principle of self-determination and its ancillary rules. It is therefore to do justice to this portion of Nino's contribution to international law, a contribution that has often gone underappreciated, that I give the floor to Professor Crawford. Nino liked to argue in life, and he, I'm going to argue with him after he's gone, with a great sense of regret. But that's what I was asked to do, and I always do what I'm asked to do. Nino identified self-determination as one of his own main themes. He lectured on it at Cambridge in the Lauder Park series in 1987, and it took him perhaps an uncharacteristic period of time to produce the book in 1995. He came to a subject which was very much written on and which everyone who'd written on it left it with a certain sense of unease as not having really captured it. I'm not sure whether Nino had the unease, but he certainly said some new things. Listen to this. It's a paraphrase from the review to which has been mentioned about the principle of self-determination. I'm, I'm working on Brownlee's eighth edition of the principles of international law. And it turns out with Brownlee, when you approach a principle of international law, it disappears. The principle is no longer there, but the facts and the circumstance and the particularities. Nino had a slightly different view about principle. Self-determination was a general principle abstracted from particular rules and procedures which give it content. But the reason for that was not because it was a general moral principle of an abstract Dawkinian sort, but because people didn't agree. It was the expression and result of conflicting views of states on matters of crucial importance. In his view, a principle was a vague standard which was able to accommodate conflicting views about its contents. It was only a principle because there were such conflicting views. Presumably, if the views didn't conflict, the principle would soon crystallize into a specific and precise rule. And by inference, it, Nino would be less interested in it. The status of a particular norm as a principle rather than a rule derived not from its generality, its application as a directive principle having weight rather than applying in an all or nothing fashion as Dworkin would have it, but from the existence of persistent disagreement about its value and effect. Self-determination was to be seen in Cassese's view as an expression of a fundamental ambivalence on the part of various actors. This ambivalence he saw as, and I quote, one if not the principal explanatory golden thread running through the historical doctrinal narrative of this book. As the reader proceeds through the vicissitudes of doctrinal development, he or she will surely find in the endless variations of this ambivalence a powerful tool of analysis. It's a very striking idea. At the time, one, as a young academic, I was inclined to think, well, Dawkins given us an account of principle, and this is an account of principle which disappears in a different way because the principle is only there because people can't agree. And yet the dynamic underlying that idea had something to be said for it, because it was true to a certain insight about self-determination, 
which Nino clearly had. He also had a great sense of value, the value associated with non-governmental action, with the action of people who were not states. We've heard about his involvement in the declaration, the Algiers Declaration, from George in his very moving account. He said that the Algiers Declaration gave teeth. This is the Algiers Declaration on the Rights of Peoples of 1976. He said it gave teeth to the principle of self-determination. I said in a rather smart way, it was, more, it was rather strange to think of a non-governmental declaration giving teeth to a, an intergovernmental principle. It was more like a picture of teeth, rather in the manner of Marguerite's well-known picture of a pipe, but with a positive caption. I'm told that Nino was rather, rather annoyed at that remark, but he forgave me. The book review editor of the American Journal said in a, in a communication, who is this Marguerite? <laughs> and in those days, one didn't have email, I faxed him the picture. Let's listen to what Nino said about self-determination in his own words. He's talking about the prohibition of foreign occupation, the rule on the internal self-determination of racial groups that have been subject to discrimination. It was one of the curiosities of his position on self-determination that the only form of non-discrimination which he thought was part of customary international law was non-discrimination on account of race. And yet these days, these days that is, one might, one might have thought the least of the grounds on which one would think that self-determination might operate as a distinct concept leading to the separation of a people. He said, these rules specify with regard to certain areas the general principle. The role of the principle is to cast light on borderline situations and to serve as a general standard for the interpretation of both customary and treaty law. The principle therefore transcends and gives unity to the customary rules. It sets out the essence of self-determination. As the ICJ put it in the Western Sahara case, self-determination requires a free and genuine expression of the will of the peoples concerned. In other words, the principle lays down the method by which states must reach decisions concerning peoples by heeding their freely expressed will. In contrast, the principle points neither to the various specific areas in which self-determination should apply, nor to the final goal of self-determination. Alongside this body of customary norms, there exists an important piece of international legislation, Article 1, common to the two UN covenants on human rights. It essentially confers on the peoples of the contracting parties the right to internal self-determination. Well, there's too much in that paragraph to be able to unwrap it here. But one point I'll make about that paragraph, it contains a single footnote to the International Court's judgment in the Western Sahara case. For the rest, Nino was his own authority. <laughs> but he was also a very good lawyer, and he went on to, to, to show considerable ambivalence himself about self-determination when it came, up, it came up against the rights of individuals. And his conclusion in this, this pa the passage that I read comes from his general text. His conclusion is actually not far away from the conservative mainstream that self-determination applies in colonial contexts, but only to internal self-determination in other contexts. So he ended perhaps skeptically. And one of the things about Nino, you always felt that there was a sense of growth in what he was doing, growth in a perhaps unpredictable way. I want to end with two anecdotes about the professor as advocate and the judge as advocate, because he was a very fine advocate in all of his capacities. The professor as advocate takes me back to the Libya Chad case, which has been mentioned. And Nino was given, I'm not sure how many times he appeared in the international court, because his later career was very much as a judge on a variety of tribunals. But 
he was given what might have been thought to be the graveyard shift in the Libya Chad case, which was a, a series of disputes about what happened in practice between France and Italy and also the inhabitants of the territories in the interwar period. He didn't have to do the map speech. The map speech really is the graveyard shift. But there wasn't a map speech in this case, at least not that I re remember. He was given the second worst speech. And he did a wonderful job. He had this incessant capacity to come back and we sat there gloomier and gloomier. We thought that the interwar period, we being the Libyan team, we thought the interwar period was one of our strengths. We ended up in a complete mess. If he didn't appear very much before the International Court, then the International Court was the loser. He was a very fine advocate. As I said, he was also capable of changing his mind. He participated in the conference on crimes of state, which led to the book of 19, I think, 88, which he co-authored or co-edited. He was then the president of the appellate body of the ICTY, the appeals chamber, when the Blaskic case came on. The Blaskic case involved the question, at least at the interlocutory stage, whether states could be subject to penalties because the Minister for Defence of Croatia had been subpoenaed to produce documents and had refused. And after all, a subpoena is something done under the threat of a penalty. Otherwise, it doesn't have any content. Well, I was commissioned for a, a nominal fee, a nominal fee of zero, to appear on behalf of the Office of the Prosecutor to argue before Judge Cassese in favour of the criminalisation of states. By this stage, my view against the criminalisation of states was already quite well known, and I was at loggerheads with the Italian school in general on that subject, though fortunately not all members of the Italian school turned out to belong to it when it came to the crunch in the ILC. So I was rather looking forward to this challenge, but unfortunately I had to teach on day one of the appeal and the prosecutor assured me that she had had a word to Judge Cassese and we would have time on the second day to debate the issues. Well, I got a phone call at the end of the first day and, and the, the prosecutor, Louise Arbour, said to me, I'm sorry, he's made up his mind. The case is over. We'll get judgment tomorrow. <laughs> I never had the opportunity. And what did he say? There is no criminal liability of states. The subpoena is a false motto. There can be no punishment of a state. And that, that decision was absolutely required in the circumstances of the time for the continued functioning of the tribunal vis-a-vis -vis Croatia. He was capable of changing his mind when it was necessary. He was a wonderful man, a wonderful fighter, a fighter for what he thought was right at the time. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Crawford, for these magnificent words that allow us to do justice to Nino's selfless battle for the rights of people and the rule of law. Nino also worked since the 1980s on projects about Palestinian self-determination under occupation, and he wrote courageous papers uh, on the use of resources of the occupied territories. But I'll leave it at that. This session would definitely be deficient if we did not allow two highly esteemed practitioners from uh, sharing, us, sharing with us their recollections and tributes to Nino. The first of these speakers is Mr. John Jones, former legal officer to Judge Cassese at the ICTY. Thank you. I'd like to start by thanking the organizers of this uh, tribute uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to say a few words about uh, Judge Cassese. And um, I have to apologize in advance that um, my uh, brief tribute will be mostly anecdotal, um, but I understand that Guido and Julia have given me a special dispensation um, to be anecdotal. Um, I'd also like to say um, what a great pleasure it is, uh, despite the sadness of the occasion, uh, to see so many familiar faces uh, from Judge Cassese's past, his many friends and colleagues. Uh, for my part, I first met Nino Cassese um, in a hotel lobby in New York City in November 1994. Uh, he was there to present the uh, tribunal's first annual report to the UN General Assembly, and he took the opportunity to interview me uh, there as a candidate for what were then called law clerks to the judges. 
uh, positions which he had helped um, to create. Uh, those being the days before mobile phones and uh, emails, I'd sent you know, half a dozen faxes beforehand to confirm our meeting, uh, growing increasingly concerned as the, meeting, as the date of the meeting drew closer that I hadn't heard back from him. And he had, in fact, received all six of my faxes, and it turned out that was the reason why he didn't at first hire me. And he said to Janice, uh, I can't have someone that nervous working for me. I'm nervous enough myself. Uh, but despite that on inauspicious beginning, um, I did come to work for Nino Cassese for nearly two years, uh, from 1996 to 1997, in the very exciting period when the ICTY um, was just being established, uh, with Nino as the ICTY's first um, president, and then again in 1998 to 1999 when he was a trial judge. And I have many fond and vivid memories of that early period, which say a lot about Nino as a person, uh, some of which I'd like to share with you. Uh, my main recollection of Nino, aside, of course, from the pioneering uh, lawmaking of his early judgments, um, to which reference has been made, uh, is of a great deal of laughter. Uh, indeed, I can't think of Nino without uh, picturing him either smiling or about to break into an infectious smile. Uh, and that's what made him such a joy to work for, as well as an inspiration. Um, I recall that he and, and Judge Avisab, coming from academic backgrounds, had a shared humor of the world of research and academia. Uh, they would tell the joke of a professor who found that his PhD student had copied all his uh, work from one book. And the professor, outraged, told the student, scholarship isn't copying your work from a book. Scholarship is copying your work from lots of books. <laughs> uh, and so he was fond of the image of himself as an eccentric professor, uh, like Woody Allen's uh, Professor Needleman, perhaps, who would sometimes forget to take the wooden clothes hangers out of his uh, jackets before he wore them. Nino would joke about the professor who, bumping into a colleague in the hallway, and chatting with him, said at the end of the conversation, which way was I coming from when you stopped me? And he said, well, that direction. He said, oh, good, that means I've had my lunch. Uh, but far from being an academic in an ivory tower, Nino was a consummate politician. Uh, I was amazed when we went to New York uh, to present the ICTY's third annual report, how Nino seemed to know instinctively how to work with the politicians to achieve what was essential to the ICTY's success. He knew how to work whole delegations of diplomats and how to get ambassadors and foreign ministers on the right side. And there's no doubt in my mind that the ICTY's very viability as an institution, as, as Judge Ebisad said, um, is due to Nino's unceasing efforts in those early days to make the world sit up and take notice of the ICTY uh, and stay true to the vision which led to its creation. Uh, on one occasion, when we met Madeleine Albright, uh, then the US's uh, permanent representative to the UN, she said, frankly, that when they, the Security Council set up the ICTY, they didn't expect uh, much to happen at all. They thought there would be one or two trials, and then the ICTY would, would um, close down. And it was thanks to Nino, as she recognized, uh, that the reality was so radically different. Uh, one of my most vivid memories of Nino's political side uh, was when we went to a meeting of the Peace Implementation um, Council, um, a body established after the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed in November 1995 um, in uh, Florence. At that meeting of foreign ministers hosted by the Italian government, uh, held in July 1996, at which Christian Chartier, who I saw earlier, uh, was also uh, memorably present, um, Nino had a seat at the table uh, as a representative of the ICTY. Um, the ICTY was then very much in its infancy, uh, and its um, future was still far from assured, with only a few accused in custody. Nino was infuriated as he sat there, as um, each government representative took the floor um, and um, uh, said how well the peace process in Bosnia was going and how everyone could pat themselves on the back for, um, for what would have been achieved. Nino then took the floor and said passionately that there was no room uh, for complacency, that refugees who had been ethnically cleansed were not returning to their homes, that the ICTYs and DITs were not being arrested, and that much more needed to be done. Uh, the effect was instant and electrifying, and about as welcome, I imagine, as when Khrushchev banged his shoe on the table at the UN. R right after the speech, Nino had to leave to give an interview to CNN, so he left me to hold his chair uh, as an angry Lamberto Dini, who was then the Italian foreign minister, took the floor. Uh, furious that the show of self-congratulation over which he'd been presiding had been exposed, he kept uh, jabbing an angry finger in the direction of, uh, of the seat lately occupied by Nino, but now nervously occupied by me. Um, <laughs> But Nino had been right to shatter the complacency, um, as the German foreign minister Klaus Kinkel um, said when he took the floor straight afterwards. Uh, Nino was not one to suffer fools gladly, uh, nor did he fear to rock the boat uh, when it needed rocking. Uh, 
And that intervention and those, uh, those like them, I'm sure, hastened the era of um, NATO arrests of ICTYs in Bosnia, which then led um, to the situation which we uh, have today, as Judge Abis had said, where, where uh, everyone has been ultimately delivered to the tribunal. Uh, I remember, too, in the same vein, uh, the day when the prosecutor, Louise Arbor, um, to considerable controversy, uh, indicted Slobodan Milosevic, uh, then the first serving head of state to be indicted by an international tribunal. And she bumped into Nino in the hallway and asked him jokingly, uh, have I started World War III? And, and Nino uh, reassured her not, and ever the feminist declared delightedly, only a woman can be that brave. Um, as the first president of the ICTY, Nino was passionate about all and any injustice. And perhaps a little known fact is that we once had a mini trial at the UN detention unit uh, because Dusko Tadic, the ICTY's first indictee, uh, claimed that a prison guard had kicked his cell door shut, thereby knocking him uh, in the head. And we conducted a reenactment with Nino playing the role of Dusko Tadic uh, and me playing the role of the prison guard. And I, I, I delivered a feeble kick to the door to see if it was possible to cause injury by kicking it closed. And the heavy metal door barely moved. Uh, no, 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 Nino said. No, do it properly. So I gave the door an almighty kick and it slammed shut with a sickening thud. And I raced to the door to see if I had knocked Nino out cold. Um, but, but fortunately he was unhurt and his head came round the, the door and he said, so it is possible. And nodding thoughtfully... <laughs> Uh, just as Sherlock Holmes might have said to a, a blundering Dr. Watson. Um, the guard was subsequently found responsible of the abuse. Uh, Nino, former president of the European Committee uh, for the Prevention of Torture, was not one to tolerate uh, any mistreatment of those in custody. Um, those are just a sprinkling of my many fond and significant memories of President Cassese. Um, as I said in an earlier vadimecum uh, to Nino, of those whom the world considers great, I have no doubt that Nino was truly great. Uh, he was not just a great visionary and a great international lawyer, but a great person and a wonderful friend. Uh, the last occasion when I saw Nino was in 2008, uh, when he came at my invitation to speak at an event at my chambers uh, commemorating the 60th anniversary of the Genocide Convention. And with the benefit of hindsight, now, knowing now of his illness, and not to mention his other commitments, uh, it cannot have been comfortable or easy for him to travel to London um, to give his speech. Uh, and I'm sure that he did so mainly out of a sense of loyalty and friendship. And it was typical of Nino, and, and the measure of him, uh, that he acted from such decent motives uh, without regard to his own comfort, uh, comfort and convenience. He will be sorely missed. Thank you. Thank you, John. It is definitely appropriate that practitioners and judges, professors and colleagues from the four corners of the world, from different backgrounds and persuasions, have all joined us in this tribute, the first of many tributes, I'm sure, to Antonio Cassese. He was really a citizen of the world, with friends in every corner of the globe and a strong will to improve the human, the human lot. And when I say that he had friends everywhere, I should add that for him, being a friend to somebody meant to tell them the naked truth, to criticize them, even ruthlessly, if need be, to force, in a sense, their continued improvement and striving to perfection. I'm sure many of you have had personal experiences of this. His idea of friendship was such, to tell friends the truth as he saw it, to force you to account for your behavior, and if need be, to improve. Again, at times, a very painful experience, if you happen to be the addressee, but also a really healthy one. Finally, a view from the bench. Judge Kwon, Vice President of the ICTY and presiding judge over several cases, as well as a colleague of Professor Cassese on the board of the Journal of International Criminal Justice, will close this tribute with a few words of his own, for which we are grateful. Judge Kwon, you have the floor. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my humble honor to conclude this gathering by paying tribute to our beloved friend and colleague, Judge Antonio Cassese. As we reflect on the lessons of the ICTY Global Legacy Conference, which we have, we have just concluded at the World Forum, we do so with a profound awareness 
that the legacy of this tribunal, and indeed the entire field of international criminal law, is fundamentally intertwined with that of a great scholar and jurist, Nino Cassese. Nino was the man who reawakened international criminal law, a field that had long been dormant since the Nuremberg trials. Indeed, it is a tribute to Nino's legacy that one cannot conceive of how the various international criminal tribunals would have been established without him. Although Nino was a contemporary of mine in the field of criminal, in the international criminal law, and we worked closely together on the law journal he founded, the Oxford Journal of International Criminal Justice, actually, he has always been my mentor and role model. It was through Nino's book on international criminal law that I first grasped the powerful idea of international criminal justice. And I vividly recall being shocked the first time I read the Tadic appeals decision as it enlightened me about so many crucial dimensions of international criminal law. As a person, Nino was such a sweet, amicable, and humble man. He had a never-ending academic curiosity, energy, and sense of humor. He was always humbly attentive and meticulous in nature, and his infectious personal passion for our work never ceased. In fact, Nino often recalled working on Christmas Day, 1993, to prepare the ICTY rules of procedure and evidence, but quote and unquote, but only five hours, he said. Since Nino's passing, I have heard many other touching stories that perfectly exemplify Nino's personal and professional legacy. For example, in the soliloquy section of his book, The Human Dimension of International Law, Nino stated, I quote, with hindsight, I feel that while perhaps my practical action has been somehow helpful, I have not contributed much to legal scholarship, unquote. What a tremendous example of modesty from a man whose publication list runs 12 pages long. Another example is the Oxford Journal of International Criminal Justice, which Nino founded without any discernible institutional or financial support. He was armed only with faith in his mission and unstinting support of his friends. In, his, in this spirit, he also used the, royal, the royalty proceeds from his ICC commentary to fund expensive translations of French and German legal essays on international and, cr international and criminal law. He did so in order to broaden and deepen academic resources for judges and lawyers practicing before the international courts and tribunals. I have also long been aware that Nino generously donated any award money he received to the journal's prizes for the best article and best book proposals by young scholars, while other money went into the idea of an OUP series of monographs by young scholars. Moreover, while at the STL, all of his non-tribunal income went towards an STL intern's fund so that they could be paid a modest stipend. Such acts of sincere generosity reveal the powerful way in which Nino was always investing in those around him on a personal level while also tangibly enriching the field of international criminal justice. In sum, Nino was a bridge. 
between people, between defense, judges, and prosecution, between legal cultures, and between points of view that somehow he could, he could reconcile. He was also, of course, an immense inspiration and a model of hard work, commitment, intelligence, and perseverance. He had kept the hopes of a young man all through his life, and he remained the believer among all the doubters. He believed that law could improve the fate of humanity and somehow convinced so many of us. His leadership and thought-provoking work will be sorely missed in our field. But now his spirit lives on in all of us and in this field of international criminal justice. It is now left to future scholars and practitioners to attempt to fill the big shoes he has left behind. I thank all of you for coming to this gathering and thank each of the speakers for sharing their moving tribute today. I was advised that we will now have a reception where we can continue to share our cherished stories and memories of Nino. Thank you very much.